And I want to now give you a sense of kind of like almost best practices. Um, this presentation was done just recently, um, but then there's a video there that was done uh, separately. But the presentation itself that you're gonna see now and is available if you want on manavingbabies.org forward slash renew. It is renewed because I just presented this to a group of MEPs, member of European Parliament from the group Renew Europe, Renew Europe uh, that includes uh, several parties. Um, I'm not that uh, expert, uh, but I think Macron's party is one of them. And there's a vote in the Parliament, in the European Parliament this month about a report on surrogacy with a position uh, by a left uh, a wing group that um, is very much against surrogacy. And they wanted to learn more about surrogacy. So I had the opportunity over um, a presentation and a meeting that took an hour and a half with somebody who's from an anti-surrogacy organization to have a little bit of an exchange to try to educate them. And we're going to show you a, a little bit of that presentation. And I want to then hear, hear from our European friends whether this is relevant and if they have ideas, because we want to learn from each other, from the various groups. And as I said, this is us making the case. And really, one of the first thing you do is make it personal. This is my family in Reykjavik just recently. Uh, and and you see, I mean, our babies are not babies anymore. And, um, but you start, I mean, of course, it's going to look different when you make a presentation, but uh, they're, not, they're going to be more cute, your kids. But, uh, but, but it is about real people. That's the whole point. That's, what, that's why the film Tristan is so good. It's not about legal concepts. It's about real people. And you'll see my daughter in a minute, too, because uh, what I did then, um, so first of all, We'll, we'll go through these points in a minute, but what we've learned by making the case in, in uh, New York, in Illinois, in other places in the United States is that the first thing is, the first issue that comes up, and I think you mentioned it, do we have a right for a family? And especially in Europe, a lot of people say, no, you don't have a right for children. Children are their own people. You don't have a right to have another person. But when you talk about your right to attempt to build a family, that's better. They understand that better, that you should have the chance to build your family. That is much more successful than talking about, I have a right for a child, I have an entitlement for a child. The second thing, and we'll talk about it, of course, more, make sure that what you say is, um, is has some backing, some, uh, uh, credibility through research. You don't just talk about feelings because we have feelings. We feel that this is right. That's important, you know, and you should not have a child through surrogacy unless you feel it's right. But that's not enough to communicate to other people. The other pitfall or risk is if you start getting into debate of surrogacy, yes, or surrogacy, no. That's not a good way to go about it because some surrogacy, you know, there are instances where surrogacy was done not well. We can't argue about that. It should be about how, whether pos it's possible to do surrogacy in a positive way. The moment you start doing that, Fabian talking about these protesters, I think the year before, or maybe it was the same year, we went outside with one of the surrogates that was with us and she says, but I haven't been exploited. I feel it's good. I had the right, you know, and she says, oh no, no, you're okay. But India, Ukraine, uh, Ghana, the moment they agree with you that it's possible, then the conversation is no longer about yes or no, it's about how. And that is the biggest victory you can have. Because the moment you talk about how, then you're on the same camp. We all agree that we need to do it in a good way. The next thing, and we'll talk about that, is you'll hear a lot of talk about intersecting rights and protecting rights and all those things. Power dynamics, fine, let's talk about those things. We'll show you how it is possible and how we partnered with organizations that show it's possible to do it by, while protecting rights, while uh, taking care of power dynamics, power imbalances and all those things. 
and we'll get into that in a minute more. And then, of course, the issue of compensation, we'll get into that. You can't talk about surrogacy. And then they say, but you can't compensate. We feel, you might not agree with us, that it is a mistake to say, yeah, yeah, you're right. So we'll, we'll do surrogacy, but with no compensation. I think you're losing the argument there. And you might need to get into this issue and explain what, why we feel that it could be done with a compensation. Maybe not exactly the way it's done in the United States, but we'll get into that in a minute. And then is it a, is it a gay issue? You mentioned that. Is it a gay issue? Is it not a gay issue? How do we feel about it? You, you can't talk about surrogacy without asking that question yourself. And then lastly, as I mentioned before, there are real children at the end of this. Is this about punishing them? You always need in your argument also to tell them, regardless of what you think, if you don't want to have surrogacy here, that's fine. But as long as it is legal to go to the United States and have it there and bring the child here, don't try to punish the child. Don't, pun don't try to treat them as a poison fruit, as they say in legal uh, language sometimes, something that came from something that was wrong. So the first thing I want to say, and this is an example now of, of a program like this, the ARF, the Advocacy and Research Forum we did in New York in uh, exactly two years ago, just before COVID, um, where it was the last stages of legislating in New York. New York was one of the states, last states, there's now only a couple, that where surrogacy was not legal. And we fought for it for many years. And we created a coalition and we were part of co the legislative coalition and we created a coalition in an event. So a real tip, a real suggestion we have is create coalitions, bring other perspectives internally, bring perspectives of children, of, of surrogates, of, you know, of uh, uh, human rights activists, of reproductive rights activists. So you'll see how we did it. This is a short clip, uh, a, a minute and a half. Uh, you'll just see examples of the perspective we brought over, actually it was more, it, it was a longer program than here. And it is all in our video library. The whole program is in our video library. Uh, so you can find it. So let's see if this works. I mean, I have had a few situations where I've encountered people who are just adamant with the fact that how can you give your baby away and, it, and that's probably what bothers me the most because it's like it was never my baby to start with. Trying to understand how this issue intersects with our other issues but also recognizes and addresses and protects the rights of all of the parties involved in a surrogacy contract, in particular the rights of the person acting as a surrogate. I thought the two big takeaways from that study were that there was no greater psychological distress based on any type of bonding between the mother and the baby. We looked at 10 areas of human rights that are implicated, including the right to equality and non-discrimination, bodily autonomy, reproductive autonomy, and again, the right to found a family. And most importantly, never forgetting the rights of the resultant child to having a secure place within his family or her family upon birth. It came up that surrogacy was illegal in New York and they were like shocked. Because like, people would ask me questions and I'd answer them, but then they'd follow it up and I wouldn't be able to answer it. So it was like a train. I'd get an answer and then they'd come up with a new question that I'd have to research. Again, I'm using all these uh, uh, credible uh, authorities like the Human Rights Watch to say why is it so important? Because we had actually an opportunity to uh, testify in front of the uh, UN Rapporteur that was appointed over a few years ago to create a, a, a report about trafficking of children. And they decided surrogacy is about trafficking children. Let's talk about that too. And we were talking to her. And it is important, as they say, that when you talk about the, the prohibition of the sale of children to surrogacy, when you apply the trafficking and sale of children, all these language to, to surrogacy, you, you would unnecessarily dis and disproportionately uh, engage in discrimination in discriminatory fashion uh, to limit the option of surrogacy as a means of founding a family and exercising reproductive rights. So yes, we need to try to see how we're not you know, harming anybody, but just by saying, let's not do it, just to be on the safe side, let's not do it. Not allowing surrogacy is 
is harming your rights, harming our rights. So it's a matter of balancing the rights and find the right formula to have our rights and everybody else's rights live in harmony. So, um, and by the way, if you go and look at that presentation um, uh, with the uh, shortcut human-rights, rights, you will get a lot, all these positions. So Sylvia, um, why don't you take us through the next few slides and talk about when we make the case for surrogacy, um, what are the things we're addressing, like Tobias started taking us through them, and misconceptions versus reality. We're gonna do it very quickly today because this is not about that. This is just an example of how we do it. So we'll go a little quick to that. But um, you can see my screen? I can see. Oh, okay, you see. Okay, go ahead. So, oh, you wanna stand? No, I'm, I'm good. Um, so the uneducated story about surrogacy goes something like this, and you've heard parts of it already. It is uh, some woman who, like most women, hates being pregnant, has not wanted, has not enjoyed her pregnancy, what woman enjoys pregnancy, what woman enjoys giving birth, um, and is giving away her baby because she's vulnerable. She's poor, she's a minority, she's uneducated, she is influenced by someone else, uh, she doesn't know what she's doing, and she is being, um, exploited and influenced by either financial necessity or, or some kind of power differential that pulls her into the surrogacy um, situation. So that is kind of the premise that a lot of these stories work with, but the reality that we know from research and Ron mentioned the importance of being able to look at research. And I urge you to look at the Men Having Babies website, which has all these studies that show that the reality is vastly different than what these uneducated misconceptions and stigma will tell you. So in reality, what we know is that when you do surrogacy right, and this is going to be, we, we are talking here about the how, and we're talking about surrogacy done right, the way we do it in most of the United States. When surrogates are being screened, are being uh, uh, looked at, of course, there's always going to be women who want to be surrogates. In the United States, there are thousands of women who apply to be surrogates all the time. Anybody at any agency will tell you here that there are tons of women who want to be surrogates. It is a very, very small percentage of women who actually get to be surrogates because they have to go through such rigorous screening. When they finally get to be surrogates, when they pass the screening, then the women we have chosen are the women who enjoyed being pregnant, have liked that. Just this week, I had a surrogate, potential surrogate, who said that. I, I love being pregnant. I don't want to have a newborn anymore. I don't want to have a child anymore. But I know that I can give this gift to someone else. What a wonderful thing it is that I get to have joy for myself going through something that I liked doing. And I get, I get to do it for another couple who wants to get that experience and, and build that family. So many women feel empowered. They feel like it's my body and I get to do something with my body for the good of other people. This is something that is giving them a sense of autonomy. Um, many women feel like uh, have, have some sort of familiarity with same-sex marriages or same-sex couples. They either have someone in the family or have been... Um, have seen couples who uh, are same sex and cannot have babies and feel like, you know what, as a woman, this is something that I can do for them. And again, this is something that surrogates would say, I feel strongly about same sex rights and gay men's rights, and I vote with my body. This is something that I can do to show my support. So for some surrogates, it is a values statement. 
many surrogates also express their values through surrogacy by saying, you know, I'm paying back or I'm paying forward. Um, I've had surrogates and we see that in research all the time that there are surrogates who say, um, I have experienced needing the help of someone else in my life for something or another. And this is my opportunity to now do it for other people who need help or the other way around. You know, you'll have circuits who say, we are not rich, but this is our way of giving back or giving forward or teaching our children how people are interconnected. And, and I'll go to the next slide. I just want to mention, this is an example of a book, uh, an anthropological. So it's not so much a statistical, but anthropological look at surrogates. And the funny thing is when I was talking about it for the parliamentary uh, uh, hearing, the anti-surrogacy woman said, oh, I like this book too. <laughs> and, and I said, you know, and she says, yeah, yeah. but all, all the surrogates there said they really love being surrogates, fine, but they said that they wouldn't have done it without compensation. So we'll get to that in a minute. But you see, I already created a dialogue here because this is a book that depicts, and it's you can find it uh, on manyofingbabies.org forward slash books. Uh, and in a minute, we'll get to the research library as well. Um, why don't we go quickly through some of these slides, just yeah, examples so, of what we talk about. As you can see, um, in the United States, research will show you that actually the surrogates are not these vulnerable, poor, uh, black or brown women. Actually, the majority is white. The majority of them are educated. The majority, uh, half or more, have had held jobs. Um, they are definitely not disempowered or disenfranchised, and they're coming to this from a place of autonomy and knowledge and being educated and knowing exactly what they're getting into and why. And once again, we're just giving you examples. Uh, those could be lengthy. In fact, we have on our uh, video library, the full research uh, um, lecture by Mary Riddle that you saw before. And um, so, so once again, this is not random women. These are women who have been chosen for this. So we're not saying, all of humankind is like this. Uh, so, um, so talk a little bit more, more about what uh, we talk, we find yes. with typical surrogates and you make sure when you screen them that they aren't like this. The screening is very rigorous. I meet with and all psychologists, I, and I should say that in the United States, all um, surrogates are mandated to meet with mental health professionals if they have uh, partners, if they're married, their partners or husbands are um, mandated to meet with us as well. I conduct, as all my colleagues, rigorous um, screenings, mental health testing, uh, psychological testing, and we make sure they, are, they cannot be surrogates if they have psychopathology, they cannot be surrogates if they have uh, tobacco or drug or alcohol abuse, either them or their husbands. Uh, they cannot be surrogates if they are in financial trouble. They cannot be surrogates if they need the money. Um, and then we see, and we'll talk about it in, in a second, that in reality, uh, studies have shown that most of the surrogates really get those rights we'll talk about in a minute. They have their own lawyers, they get their own uh, uh, complete medical evaluation. Um, and uh, mental health uh, evaluation. So tomorrow afternoon, we'll have a session called a Mindful Look at Surrogacy, uh, and Sylvia's gonna be there as well. And we're gonna talk a little more about some of these aspects. So when and if you have an opportunity to make the case to, about surrogacy to uh, you know, any, uh, any uh, forum that uh, will be uh, interested in hearing about it, you can go into more length about those things, but we're just giving you examples here. And this is what I called before is a potential uh, trap for you. They will say, okay, sh we should all agree that it should be altruistic. And I remember I've had conversations with some of you here in the room about that. Why, why shouldn't be sur surrogacy just altruistic? We say, yes, it's always altruistic. Those women who've been screened like this, they're doing it because Altruistic means they want to help somebody else. So if you help somebody cross the street, a blind person cross the street, I don't know if they still do that. Uh, they have all these beeps and stuff. But if you help a blind person cross the street, which is like, you know, the typical when you talk to children, a good deed, your life is not really in danger. 
you're not disrupting your your life and your fam your family's life for two years, and you're not going through physical discomfort. Even if you like being surrogate uh, uh, pregnant and you like how your hair is, it's still discomfort. You're going through a lot of trouble to make this to do this good deed. You at the end of that, you don't. You're not at the beginning. You you it set you back in certain ways. You couldn't take vacations with your kids. You couldn't have sex with your husband for some of this time or your wife. Uh, you couldn't, there were a lot of things you weren't allowed to do. You deserve some, in English we call it comp compensation, but we also call it, you know, um, and actually I, I can quote uh, Human Rights Watch that they're saying those are considerations or restitution. You're basically giving them a compensation for how they were hurt by this. But they did it willingly, they wanted to help you, but they deserve this. And the reality is, like that book showed, is if you don't give them some of that compensation to, to pay back for all the, these considerations, they're not gonna be sorry, they're not gonna be able to do it. And when one country after the other, the United Kingdom and Canada in particular, we've seen that they said, okay, compromise. We'll have surrogacy, just no compensation. That's altruistic, everybody's happy. There is compensation. It's just a gray area compensation. It's just, everybody knows that it's 25 or so thousand dollars in, in, in Canada. That's what they, they tolerate. The only problem is now you make the surrogates into liars because they need to bring all their receipts, you know, for gas and for this to, to pretend that they really have expenses only. But nowhere does surrogacy work so the biggest trap is they'll say, okay, let's make, let's do a compromise. We'll have surrogacy, but no, no uh, compensation. But by the way, and I think this is in the Netherlands right now. And by the way, once we do that, we will prohibit you go to, from going to those bad places that have commercial surrogacy. And in the Netherlands, that's a real possibility right now that they will allow altruistic surrogacy. Maybe a tenth of the people will be able to be parents and everybody else will not be allowed to go to the United States and Canada anymore. So this is a trap. It's once again, it's, we can talk about this for an hour, if not longer, just about this. But be careful of this trap. If it's just about giving your kids rights, then fine. But if it's, if it's about legislating surrogacy in your country, you'll be left with nothing. And we feel that this is right. The surrogates feel this is right. We have studies we've done with surrogates how would they feel about the compensation? It's not tied to outcomes. You don't get the compensation only if the child is healthy or if there's a child altogether. You're not buying something, you're not renting something, which is how they call it in, in, in Spanish, renting a womb. You're not, uh, you're not uh, uh, paying her, the surrogate for her skills. There's no good surrogate and bad surrogate. It might be a good match and a bad match, but surrogates are not working for you. They're not your, and we'll talk a lot more about it tomorrow, but these are some of the, and, and, and once again, our position is that it's the physical discomfort, the disruption to their lives and the medical risk they're taking that warrants this altruistic act to also include restitution. And by the way, I apologize for not having simultaneous translation today. I understand that some of these terms are very, very uh, nuanced, um, uh, but um, you know, we'll, we'll try, we're streaming and everything, we'll try maybe to add uh, translation to our, um, so, so I think we don't have a lot of time, uh, right now actually we have no time, <laughs> sorry. So let me just say that when we talk about research, we, go, we cover all these issues. Uh, so quickly, Sylvia, just, uh, uh, go over these issues that without proving them now. But. Well, I, I think that what you need to know is that um, when someone says to you, you brought the child to the world and all you can do now is damage control, there is no damage control to be done. There is no damage to the child. The child is okay. Children of parents through surrogacy are fine. Children of gay parents through surrogacy are fine. The surrogates are fine. Their children and their families are fine and stronger for them having done it. And gay parents 
their self-esteem, their, their social uh, contacts, they are fine. They are getting better and stronger through having done this. So there is no damage control for anyone to, to, um, to do. And again, if you go to our library of research, you will see study after study that uh, proves and, and reiterates these points. And, and this two years ago in this building, we had the advocacy and research forum and out of that came the idea to have this library. So we have this library on our website, uh, simply uh, managingbabies.org forward slash research. And once again, managingbabies forward slash renew, you'll get the whole presentation here, including all the links. And as, as Sylvia was just saying, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of studies and uh, Milden Fest has a, has a Dutch uh, uh, research library as well. And we encourage all of you and anybody that finds a new study to let us know about it and we'll add it there. Um, when I spoke to the MEPs uh, two weeks ago, the person who spoke against surrogacy said the words violence against women, baby selling, violence against women, baby selling about 50 times and not a single study she was able to show that proves any of what she was saying. She was just talking about the gut feelings. And then I say, and then I showed all that. You see how disproportionate it is and how effective it could be. I will quickly say that when we mentioned a lot of things here, so once again, you can see that there are best practices and there's something we created uh, called the framework for ethical surrogacy. We'll talk about it tomorrow as well. And uh, uh, it's available also in your handout uh, section of this uh, conference which talks about how, you know, the best practice of surrogacy. And the bill in New York, for instance, follows very, very closely uh, some of, um, all of those with some exceptions. So we don't have time to talk about it, but as I said, when we present it to uh, legislators, we go in detail about how you can make sure that all these rights are protected because it doesn't happen on its own. It, it's not true in a lot of countries. And we'll talk about that tomorrow morning. Not every country has this. And lastly, um, I will actually, it is possible. It, it, even Human Rights Watch and the Center for Productive Rights say that it is, that's how, what they witness in the United States is a case in which um, that it is done with, that in, in a way that ensures legal certainty and the respect, protection and fulfillment of the human rights of all stakeholders. And I didn't get into the issue of human of, of legal certainty. That's another compromise sometimes people make and say, okay, we'll have surrogacy, but the surrogate will have the right to change her mind after the baby's born. And they think the surrogates are gonna be so thankful to get this right to kidnap your child. You know, and it doesn't make sense. Once again, it comes out of ignorance. Surrogates don't want that. Surrogates want legal clarity. They're carrying your child. They don't want the legislator to come and tell them, like an adoption mother, think about it. Do you really want to give away this child? No, it's not her child. So in, in, in some countries, including the United Kingdom still, they have the right for cooling off period during which they're allowed to change their mind. But of course, if that's going to be your only problem with your legislation, you're going to be in a good spot. So that's not usually the first problem we have. And quickly, is it a gay issue? So we say, no, it's not a gay issue. You know, most surrogacy are done for heterosexual people. It's important, first of all, so as to say, on the one hand, you see it's a little nuanced. On the one hand, we don't want to take the burden of everybody, you know, surrogacy. And in fact, sometimes we're being asked to take the burden of other causes. Like they would say, genetic engineering, gender selection, you know, that has nothing to do with surrogacy. You can debate gender selection, you know, the, uh, whether it's right or wrong, but it's done outside of surrogacy and you don't have to do gender selection when you do surrogacy. So the first thing you need to do, that's another trap, is whenever somebody says that, then they'll say it. And she said it, you know, genetic engineering. You don't have to do genetic engineering. You don't have to do those things. But the other thing is we don't have to take the burden, but there is a connection to gay rights. 
those of you who are either from Ireland or Switzerland or Italy or France know that when we were fighting for our rights for marriage equality, the no campaign said, oh, you'll get surrogacy, be careful. Isn't that true? And so they use surrogacy to demonize gay rights and to use gay people to demonize surrogacy. And we can't hide, we can't pass. Heterosexual couples don't have to carry the burden of advocating for surrogacy because they will never be prevented from taking their child from nursery school. The nursery school teacher is not even gonna ask. We can't pass, we are visible. So we carry the burden of advocating for surrogacy and we suffer from anti-surrogacy sentiments and surrogacy suffering from anti-gay sentiments. So when we advocate for surrogacy rights and for surrogacy acceptance and for acceptance of the family, we need to have as allies the whole gay community. They need to understand that if they allow us to be demonized, it, it has to do with the entire community. And lastly, we mentioned that, don't punish the children. You, whenever you make the case for surrogacy, make a clear distinction. And that is one thing we definitely you know, managed to, carry, to uh, carry across to the UN Rapporteur. At the very least, when the children exist, you, you can pass a law that these children have to be exterminated. Nobody's gonna do that. But if they exist, don't punish them. If you allow them to come back to the, your country, punishment is not the right way. Don't say they don't have health insurance. They don't have the right for a school. That should be outside of the argument. That there shouldn't be your way, don't have gray areas that end up punishing the children. So this is it. Uh, at least I wanna hear the reaction of uh, our uh, partners and some tips and suggestions from you.